leaders have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting through actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, here's your host, Ron Brewington. everybody, I'm Ron Brewington and welcome to the Actors' Choice. We are most honored today and pleased to have and very proud to have our guest today. He is the most recognized to the public for performing over 100 film and television roles. He broke the color barriers in stage, film and television even before the term color blind casting existed. And if that's not enough, our guest became a leading man when there were no African American matinee idols available. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Hooks. Robert, thank you so much for being here today, my brother. Thank well, you. Thanks Glad for having me, Ron. Uh, it's an extreme pleasure having us here today. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure. First of all, where were you from and where you were raised at? Well, I'm from Washington, D.C., but not the Washington, D.C. that everybody is, uh, knows about today. This was the foggy bottom in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. I was born back in the 30s and lived through the 40s and the 50s. But Washington, D.C. and Foggy Bottom is where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the true ghetto. Yeah. And uh, so there's nothing uh, to hide uh, about where I'm from. I'm from the, Wa the Washington, D.C. that used to be, mm. not the Washington, D.C. that people know today. Is this when it had northeast, southeast, all those east? It still does. It still, it does? still mm -hmm. has north. This is northwest. Mm -hmm. I was born in northwest Washington at Gallinger Hospital, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. And uh, in, 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 in Washington, D.C., and uh, grew up on a street called Newport Place. Mm. And uh, what they did was they, they kind of the city, because you know it's not a state, Washington, no. D.C., we've been trying to get statehood for and years. still are trying yes. to get statehood, mm -hmm. home rule for Washington, because it's controlled by Congress, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of ridiculous because we pay taxes yes. and, you know, it's taxation without representation. representation. Yes. So uh, hopefully one day uh, with the new uh, mayor uh, uh, now uh, pushing for statehood, um, well, like all the other mayors, including Marion Barry and... Marion Barry. Uh, yeah. Walter uh, Washington. Walter Washington, yes. yes. Uh, and so, you know, that's where I'm from, Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., the foggy bottom. Uh, and uh, it was uh, some growing up, I can tell you, my Amen. friend. We used to call it Chocolate City back in those Indeed. days. Indeed, Chocolate yeah. City. Chocolate City. Yes. 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 So what was it like growing up in D.C. for you as a kid? Well, we were poor. You know, I was born in, uh, I mean, my siblings, there were five of us. Mm -hmm. Living, I'm living. I'm the youngest. I was the, the baby boy. Uh, two sisters, two brothers, and myself. Uh, living in a railroad flat, uh, all in one bed. You know, the girls up top, the boys down in the bottom. At the bottom. Mm. Uh, and my mother was a seamstress. My father died when I was two years old. I, I, I don't remember my father. Uh, but amazingly enough, I remember when my father died. I remember. I was, a, I was two years old. My mother was holding me in her arms, and there was a knock on the door. Now, I'm two years old. I remember this. Mm -hmm. She was kind of humming, and, and a knock on the door, and I remember this, this police officer at the door. My mother was holding me, and she squeezed me and let out with this kind of this sound, which was kind of scary, but, and that was when she found out that my father had died on the railroad. He worked on the railroad tracks. Not He wasn't a porter or anything. He was a workman on the railroad tracks. So my father died when I was two. I don't remember him at all. Um, but um, And my mother raised uh, the five of us. And uh, thank God we all did very well. Yes. Thanks to her. Amen. Yeah. What was it like when you first got involved with acting? Well, when I... <laughs> This funny story about me uh, getting involved in acting. Mm -hmm. um, my sister, my oldest sister, Bernice, right. the oldest of the family, uh, was a recreational counselor at Francis Junior High School, which is a high school not far from Newport Place. 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, they had playgrounds, and that's where we went through the alley and over to Francis to uh, play and do all kinds of things. And there was Rock Creek Park was right there, and Rock Creek Park goes, of course, straight all the way through the city of Washington, D.C., into Maryland. And so it starts, because you know Washington is situated right in the middle of Virginia and Maryland. As a matter of fact, when Washington, when they started Washington, D.C., Maryland gave uh, and Virginia gave, and that's how Washington, D.C. was formed, in the middle, right? And uh, that's why it's not a state. But um, we, would, uh, we would get into all kinds of different trouble. But when, my sister was a recreational counselor, and in the summer she would do all kinds of things for, you know, for, the, for the school and for the city. And she would like to put on plays. So this time she was doing a play, and she wanted me to be in it. And I, you know, I, we all thought play, uh, being in a play was a sissy thing. You know, I don't do no play, get out of here. So she was doing a play, a musical actually, called The Pirates of Penzance. Mm -hmm. And she wanted me in it. And I said, no, 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 because you know, I was running the street with my buddies, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were running the street, getting into all kinds of things. I'm nine years old by this time. And she said, you're gonna be in my play. And I said, yeah, right, okay. So now when we're sleeping, the girls up top, the boys at the bottom, and I, of course, had said, no, I'm not going to be in your play. But my sister, all of us, all the hookses, have big, big toes. But Bernice's big toes were, she could pick up a bucket with her toes. She could write with her toes. She could do all kinds of things. Anyway, I'm laying in bed, and all of a sudden, I feel something right in the, the soft spot of my thigh. <coughs> and she's pinching me with her big toe. And she grips me in this vice. And tears were coming out of my eyes. But I wasn't about to scream because my mother, of course, would not have stood for that. Mm -hmm. She said, you're going to be in my play, right? You're going to be in this play. And I go, OK, I'll be in the play. I'll be in the play. So anyway, so now that's how I got cast in the first play I ever did in my life. I was nine years old. My sister was producing and directing uh, Pirates of Penzance. And I had to do it, and I had to wear tights and things like that. And I th thought that my buddies would, would, uh, would laugh at me, you know, because uh, we all thought being on a stage and a play was a sissy thing. <clears throat> but they didn't. They came. We jammed, packed the house uh, at the Francis Junior High School Auditorium. Mm -hmm. And the reason we packed the house, and it was one of my earlier days as a producer, I mean, I was nine years old, when we, after rehearsals, my sister, Carol Lee, my other sister, would send us all out into the neighborhood to knock on doors and ask people to come see the play that we're doing over it. And these are people that had never been to theater, never seen a, a play at all. And that was, um, that I remember it so well, having to go knock on doors and tell people to come see us. We're in this play over at Francis Junior High School. And uh, one old lady said to me, she said, oh, you mean somebody's grandmother? Oh, you mean you, you want us just to come and see you play on the stage? I said, no, 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 no. We're in a play, and we would like everybody in the community to come see the play. And sure enough, when we opened that play, and we ran the play for a couple of weeks, the house was packed. And there were my buddies, Babe Wages, Billy D, and not Billy D, but uh, Robert T, and, and, uh, and, and Junior Neal, and all my old buddies. I thought they were going to be making fun of me on stage, but they didn't. They hung in there because I was doing my thing on stage. And at the end of the play, when we all came out to take our bows, I'll never forget this. We came out, and one of my dear, dear friends, Charlotte Neal, was playing the lead opposite me. And we were the last two on the stage. We came out and we bow. And I'll never forget what listening to that audience did to me. I mean, to hear that audience and to feel the audience appreciating what you did on that stage. Yes. I'm nine years old, wow. mind you. That's uh, what got me started in theater. From that point on, when I went back to school, this was a summer, mm -hmm. when I went back to school, joined the drama club. Mm -hmm. Every time I went and moved to junior high school, high school, I joined the drama club. And that was the beginning of, uh, of acting for me. Mm thanks to my sister Bernice. Smell the grease paint world. Oh man. yeah, no question. And I knew exactly what I was really 
put down here to do. Uh, and I've been doing it all my life. Amen. I've been in the industry for 55 years. I've been acting uh, starting in 1960 on Broadway. Please tell your sister thank you for pinching you. Uh, well, fortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, she's gone. Uh -huh. But uh, we, 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 I repeated that story yes. of her pensioning me. As a matter of fact, it's in, in my book, my memoir, yes. uh, about that story. It's a funny story whenever I tell it. You yes. know, I, I just will never forget Bernice, mm. my dear sister, mm. saying, you are going to do my play. And I'm saying I'm not going to do it. But when that vice caught me, and the, oh, the, oh, you talk about some pain. Anyway, that got me started. In 1959, you moved to New York City to become an actor. And here you are working in the Big E. Uh, debuting is Bobby Dean Hooks. That's right. That, my name is Bobby Dean Hooks. My name's not Robert Hooks. Uh -huh. I changed my name. Uh, Actually, you know how I changed my name from Bobby Dean Hooks to Robert Hooks? I did a play, big, a big successful play for my career. It was called mm -hmm. Dutchman. Uh, Leroy Jones, who, who uh, right after that became uh, Amiri Baraka. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dutchman. And uh, Roscoe Lee Brown, my dear, dear friend Roscoe Lee Brown, came to see me in a play. The billing was Bobby Dean Hooks. That was my name, Bobby Dean Hooks. And uh, he came backstage, and he just loved what he saw. It was a great play. I mean, if you guys haven't, haven't seen Dutchman, the play, it's really quite brilliant. Um, he said we went out to have drinks afterwards at a restaurant called Chumley's right down the street in, West, in the West Village. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and he said, Robert, that's who you are. You're no longer Bobby Dean. He said, we already have a Billy D, so you can't be a Bobby Dean. <clears throat> and so uh, the next play that I did right. uh, on, the, on, the, on the poster and the billboard was Robert Hooks. Wow. And it was because of Roscoe Lee Brown. So, yes, my real name is Bobby Dean Hooks. Uh, Bobby Dean was, that was it. Yes. But now, of course. And when I hear Bobby Dean, when I hear people call, when I hear Bobby, I know it's somebody that's, that's known me for, for a, long, for a time. long time. Yes, yes. Um, the, actually, the Bobby Dean story, my father named me Bobby Dean. Right. He did not like Robert. He didn't like, you know, he had already had a James and a, and a Charles, but he wanted me to be Bobby. So, so he, and at the time, there was a picture for the Washington Senators at the time, whose name was Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean, yes. Okay. And so he loved Dizzy Dean. He loved baseball, my father. Now, I'm just a two-year-old. I mean, I'm, I'm just born, as a matter of fact. And uh, so then I was, he, he named me Bobby Dean, right? Not Robert, Bobby Dean. Well, I found out later mm -hmm. that Dizzy Dean was the racist of all racists, okay? I mean, from the South, and he was a true racist. And I thought... I got Dean in my middle name here. So when I really finally changed my name, I was happy to get rid of the Dean, gotcha. uh, Bobby Dean. But, you know, uh, it is what it is, it is my real name. Yeah. yeah. In 1964, you formed a group called the Group Theater Workshop. Indeed. Can you talk about that, sir? I'd love to talk about the Group Theater Workshop because that was the beginning of, uh, for me, mm -hmm. I was doing Dutchman, mm -hmm. and Dutchman was a big, big success. Right. Big success. At, right after Raisin in the Sun, Dutchman was a big success. And uh, I was getting all kinds of notoriety around town, doing all the shows and, you know, radio and television shows because I was starring in Dutchman, right? Well, the, I was living in Chelsea at the time, which is mm -hmm. in Manhattan, mm -hmm. down in the kind of garment district in Manhattan. And uh, the Chelsea Civil Rights Council uh, was across the street at the Hudson Gill. Mm -hmm. And they knew that I lived right on 28th Street. I lived right across from the playground, gotcha. from the Hudson Guild. And uh, so they asked me if I'd come talk to the Civil Rights uh, 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 Council that they were having, uh, an event that they were having, if I would come and talk about theater and about the play and about being an actor and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I said, sure, I'd love to, you know. So I went and I talked that night, and all of the the young kids that I knew 
because I lived right across the street. I'd go play basketball with the kids because I played basketball, and or I did then. And uh, I knew most of the kids. So I talked about what I was doing. I talked about theater. I talked about black theater in particular uh -huh. because it was, you know, it was we were really in, in bad straits, even though Raisin in the Sun was a big hit and then I was in Dutchman, which was a big hit. Uh, we still had problems getting actors, jobs, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I talked to the, the council that night. After this thing was over, I found myself in the playground underneath a, one of the lampposts talking to uh, 25, 30 kids, just asking me questions about acting, writing, dancing, poetry, whatever. So I said, look, I'm in a play, and my off night is Monday. Monday nights are off-Broadway nights, off. I said, Monday night, come on over to my house. You know where I live, right? Because I was right, right across the street. I said, you guys, come on over. We can talk about theater. We can talk about acting. We can talk about whatever it is you want to do. We can talk about it because, you know, that's you know, what I believe that in giving back to, you know, I use my celebrity, I use my expertise to give back to the youngsters. The next Monday in my house was about 35 or 40 young kids, not just from Chelsea, but from Harlem, from Bedford-Stuyvesant, from all around in the Bronx, in my living room, and I had them all tell me about themselves and what they wanted to do, and, I, and that was the beginning of the group theater workshop because we started having classes. Mm -hmm. um, I knocked out, we knocked out a wall and built a stage in my living room, <laughs> right? right? I eventually had, got evicted yeah. from that particular <laughs> yeah. place, but that's how serious I was. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was serious about it, Ron, because I saw how serious these young kids, who were kids off the street, right. would never have the opportunity mm -hmm. to pursue acting or writing poetry or directing or whatever <clears throat> so uh so i we you know every monday night and the, it grew and grew and you know there must have been maybe 75 or 80 wow. young kids from all around new york uh in this actor robert hooks's house you know and uh in the in the the, the neighborhood people in the neighborhood was wondering what's going on What's going on in this actors? Yeah. What are all these kids in and out of there, and a lot of them were making noise out in the, mm -hmm. outside of the house, whatever. So I decided what we, this is after we had established ourselves and gave ourselves a name. And I, I, I was just so in love with these kids because they were so sincere. Mm -hmm. Having a, now a place to come and study, tuition free, I don't believe in charging why would i charge these kids right where would they get the money first mm -hmm. of all so this was all tuition free and uh all of a sudden the group theater workshop became the talk of new york and these people in the neighborhood were wondering and i said let's put on a show for these people let's show them by that time the act of the young kids were really quite brilliant right mm -hmm. we were doing some poetry and staging all kinds of scenes from plays and things like that. It was really quite wonderful. So I decided to go to Edward Albee, who was one of the great writers, mm -hmm. and he was producing the play Dutchman that I was in. Mm -hmm. Edward Albee and Richard Barr and Clinton Wilder were the three producers of that play. I went to them and I said, I want, on Monday night, I want to use the theater because I want to put a showcase on for the people in my neighborhood. Let them see what these kids are doing in my house. Because everybody was wondering what was going on down yes. there, right? Well, we put on a show. Barbara Ann Tier. I don't know if you know who Barbara Ann Tier was, but Barbara Ann Tier is one of the great actresses and dancers and teachers. And mm -hmm. she had the National Black Theater up in Harlem. As a matter of fact, the theater is still there, run by her daughter, uh, Sade. Uh, but Barbara Ann Tier and I put on a show. It was called um, We Real Cool. <laughs> and We Real Cool is a poem from Gwendolyn Brooks. Mm -hmm. And so we designed a whole evening called We Real Cool because the kids were indeed real cool. And the poem, We Real Cool, was the opening. And what I needed was a, was a way. So we put the evening together. 
In rehearsals, I needed to close the evening out with something special. At the time, Douglas Turner Ward had written two comedies, Happy Ending and Day of Absence. Happy Ending was a four-character play. Day of Absence was like a 15-character play. So I, took the, I asked Doug if I could do the play, the Happy Ending play, the four-character play, using the kids. And, and Hattie Winston was one of them. Uh, Tony Antonio Fargus was one of them. Mm. A lot of wonderful kids came through the group theater workshop. That was the very beginning. So he let me put Happy Ending at the end of the evening of We Real Cool. And it was, we had the house was packed with all the people from the community. And I didn't know this because we didn't invite critics to come see it because it's just kids, right? Yes, right. Turns out the next morning in the, in the New York Post, Jerry Talmer, which was, was at the time one of the top critics, serious top critics, was there that night. He saw these young kids, what they were doing on that stage. And what really blew his mind was that play at the end called Happy Ending from Douglas Stern Award <clears throat> that I directed and directed four of my best actors in those roles. Jerry Talmer the next morning, and this is all in the newspapers, this is all history, right, wrote a review of Robert Hooks's group theater workshop and he talked about what we did that night. And I thought, if we get that kind, and the play, Happy Ending, was most of the review. It was just, he blew his mind, right? So I went to Douglas, because we were trying to get the plays done, Happy Ending and Day of Absence. We were trying to get them done, taking the plays and getting doing backers auditions for the plays, but we couldn't raise a dime, right? After that review, I went to Douglas. I said, let me, let me produce these plays. I can produce these plays. This would be my first venture at producing. I went out, and he said, fine, if you can get the, because a, a, a white producer, a friend of his, mm -hmm. had the rights to the two plays. And he says, if Sam gives you the rights, well, Sam was happy. <laughs> he was happy because he couldn't raise a dime for these plays. He said, fine, take the plays. Mm -hmm. I went, I don't know if you heard of Stax, you must have oh, heard yeah. of Stax Records. Oh, yes. Al Bell Al and Bell. Clarence Avon were the were the moguls at Stax. Uh, Juanita Poitier, Sidney's wife at the time. And actually, she wasn't his wife at the time. But Juanita Poitier called uh, Clarence Avon and Al Bell and told them that I had this, these two plays that I wanted to produce off-Broadway. And they invited me to Frank's up in Harlem, which is one of the great restaurants mm -hmm. in Harlem, for lunch. Mm -hmm. I took the two plays, and I went and I sat down with Clarence and Al Bell at the table. Place was packed, right? Probably the most famous restaurant in Harlem. Next to Small's Paradise. Well, no. At the time, <laughs> at the time, Frank's was the restaurant. Right, I'm talking that's about right. anyway. Small's was there, and Small's was great. That's family right. member. That's what uh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I performed. Mm -hmm. Those two plays at a luncheon table at Frank's restaurant, people were sitting and having lunch. They were so taken, and I was just carried away. And I read all the roles, wow. did all the roles. They didn't even let me finish reading the first act mm -hmm. of these plays. They said, how much money do you need to do these plays? Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, of course, you can't do anything for $35,000, but that's what my budget was. I thought I was going to go up to have lunch with these guys. Maybe they'd give me five grand or maybe ten grand. Yes. They gave me $35,000 the next day. Wow. That was the beginning of my producing career, and that's when Happy Ending and Day of Absence became a big hit off Broadway, and the rest, of course, is Negro Ensemble Company history and all that. But that's how it started. Hmm. That's how it started. New York City at that time, in the Renaissance and post, post and after the Renaissance, was a place to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, were people back at that era, were they thinking about Hollywood or was it New York? Oh, no. Hollywood was not even in the picture. Not even in the picture. Mm -hmm. New York, uh, black theater was moving into its heyday. It was burgeoning, right? Mm -hmm. Raisin in the Sun was first. Uh, Dutchman came behind that, Happy Ending Day of Absence, and then other plays came behind that. Theater, mm -hmm. acting, 
directing, producing, which is what I wanted all these youngsters to learn, to be a part of. But New York was the place. New York was the place to be for theater, for especially for black theater. Hollywood came later, mm -hmm. and thank goodness, because I became a part of that as well. Yes. But that's not now. New York was theater, mm -hmm. and black theater was burgeoning. It was just growing. Uh, the new Lafayette Theater started. Woody King King's started theater, down yes. at New Federal. Mm -hmm. The Negro Ensemble Company, needless to say, was the, the axis of it all. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it was New York was the place to be, and uh, I migrated to New York. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I told you the story about how I really came to New York. I was in Philadelphia. I was living in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. My mother had remarried, and I moved to Philadelphia in high school. And I was uh, studying acting at a, a school, a drama school, called the Bessie V. Hicks School of uh, Drama. Uh, Charlie Deerkop, uh, Bruce Dern was a member of it. Bruce Dern. Uh, right, whose daughter, um, um, Laura Dern, is now a big star in Hollywood, but he's a big star, too. He was nominated for an Academy Award last year or the year before. But anyway, he went, we went to school together in Philadelphia. We would see plays. Mm -hmm. Because Philadelphia is a tryout town. Yes. That's where the plays that are going to Broadway mm -hmm. come through Philadelphia, then they go to Chicago, Boston, then they go to New York. I had never seen a black play. I'd seen a lot of white plays. Mm -hmm. And I would go, we would sneak into, well, it's called second acting. I mean, sneaking in is not nice. <laughs> but we, we, we didn't pay to get in. But we would see all the plays, right? But I never saw any black plays mm -hmm. until this one play was coming through town. I had heard about it, I had read about it, and I started talking it up. There's a play coming to town, it's a black play. All black actors for the one white actor, white, white character at the end of the play. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a play that I just had to see. And long story short, I sat in the theater when I saw this play and I cried like a baby, mm. watching these black actors mm -hmm. up on that stage. Sidney Poitier, Claudia McNeil, Diana Sands, Ivan Dixon, uh, Lou Gossett, mm. uh, just an amazing cast wow. uh, of actors. Glenn Turman, Glenn Turman was the young boy <laughs> in the play, and I sat there after that play was over. I actually broke my watch because I jumped, when the play was over, I was bravoing and jumping up. I learned to say bravo because I had gone and snuck into so many of these. <laughs> and I would do the regular theater goes, go bravo, bravo, bravo. I jumped up, I broke my watch band because I was happy and so happy because I saw this play. Well, I went backstage. The play was called The Raisin in the Sun. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't even gone to Broadway. It was just still, you know, in Philadelphia. And that from there they went to Chicago. I knew when I saw that play, I sat there crying like a baby watching these actors on that stage, wishing that it was me up there. But by that time, I had done Shakespeare. I was doing all kinds of things, but I had never seen a black play. And there was a raisin in the sun. I went backstage. I couldn't get into Sidney's dressing room. Mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier was the star of the show. But his dressing room was crowded. I couldn't get in there say, okay, I'll go to Claudia McNeil's dressing room. So I went, and that was crowded. I couldn't get into the big star's dressing room, but then I, down at the end of the hall were the men's dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd go in there. There, I go in there, there was Lou Gossett, Ivan Dixon, uh, Lonnie Elder, Douglas Turner Ward, uh, Ed, King, Ed uh, uh, Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I went and I introduced myself, and I'm a local actor, whatever, whatever. <laughs> told him how much I loved the show. Mm -hmm. Long story short, again, three, four months later, I was in New York. I had booked a room at the YMCA, packed up. Huh? On 35th Street? No, no, no uh, 34th Street, downtown, 34th Street. Uh, didn't get up to 125th Street until there's another story. I <laughs> won't go into that. But I had to go to New York. Yes. I had to get on the stage. Ironically, the very first professional play I did after I moved to New York was A Raisin in the Sun, the wow. play that prompted me to move to New York. By that time, it was a big, big hit. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
That was my first Broadway play, and I replaced Lou Gossett in the play. So I was in the original Broadway play replacing Lou Gossett. I did not open it on Broadway, but I joined it on Broadway, which to me was just as much this is important. And that was the play that prompted me to move to New York. Wow. In 1963, you, your television career began, didn't it? Indeed. Yes. I think it was East Side, West Side was the first play. Well, that was actually, East Side, West Side was a big uh, television series with, with, uh, uh, with Cicely Tyson was in it. Uh, uh, George C. Scott and Cicely Tyson were, the, I just, I played Cicely Tyson's boyfriend in it. And I just did maybe two or three of those. Mm -hmm. But the play, the, 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 the television series that was mine mm -hmm. was called NYPD. Yes. The New York Police Department. And uh, that was, uh, again, the beginning of my uh, screen career, uh, being a part of, uh, there were three stars of that, uh, that show, Jack Warden, Frank Converse, and myself. Hmm. So NYPD was my first big television series. Wow. And uh, it was a big hit. And um, that, uh, that was what kind of, um, between Dutchman mm -hmm. and NYPD, I was a working as actor in New York. I've done eight Broadway plays. Mm. Now, you will not find actors no. that have done eight Broadway plays. Some of them haven't even done one. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them didn't last that long, but <laughs> still, I did eight Broadway plays, many off-Broadway plays, and then, of course, became a producer, mm -hmm. and the Negro Ensemble Company was uh, the beginning of my real producing career. Because you did 49 episodes on uh, uh, NYPD, yeah. NYPD was like um, two, two seasons, two and a half seasons, mm -hmm. uh, and um, a lot of fun. We shot the whole series. We shot 85% of the series in the streets, on the streets of New York. Wow. We had a, 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 a studio, a mm -hmm. set. Mm -hmm. uh, the precinct was in a set downtown. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, the studio that we shot that we used uh, the set mm -hmm. was uh, one of the gangsters. I can't remember which one. One of the big gangsters had this place down down in uh, the East Village, mm -hmm. and 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 it had tunnels in it so he could escape the cops and things. That was where we shot NYPD, the interior. Mm -hmm. But the majority of NYPD was done um, on the streets of New York. And what was beautiful about doing NYPD was it was the series shot in New York. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get the best actors because it was Broadway and off Broadway. Right. <clears throat> Al Pacino did his first film as a part of NYPD. And what's interesting about that is that Kevin Hooks, who was a young boy mm -hmm. who would come up from Philadelphia to see his dad to be with me, and he would be on the set all the time. And ironically, it turns out that Kevin is a big time producer, director. Whenever I was looking for him, I knew where to find him. He was sitting behind the camera, looking through the camera. Um, but uh, Al Pacino uh, had a scene in NYPD mm -hmm. where this little kid comes and knocks on the door, brings him a note or something. He grabs the kid and he pulls the kid into the room. Yes. And the kid says, oh, mister, you're hurting my arm. You're hurting my arm. <laughs> that was Kevin Hooks mm -hmm. at nine. He was nine. I started when I was nine. That was Kevin's first piece of film. Wow. And, it, and he was playing opposite Al Pacino, mm. which was his first film. Wow. That was uh, some very interesting history yes. uh, in my family, certainly. Mm. But yeah, that's when Kevin got his, uh, his film to start. Okay. Yeah. We got a couple of uh, photos we'd like to take a look at. Uh, uh, that was take, go back photos to of me? Yes, of you. Back oh, to, goes back God. into history. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here's one. Oh, that's actually that's from Hurry Sundown. That was okay. uh, that was from I believe it's Hurry Sundown. You know, yeah, that, that's that's Hurry Sundown, okay. the Otto Preminger film. Where Diane Carroll and I played uh, lovers in mm -hmm. that film. Uh, big, big star-studded uh, cast. Otto Preminger. That was the one I told you about when he called me on the phone. Mm -hmm. That was Hurry Sundown. Gotcha. Okay. Next one. That's NYPD. That's, NYPD. That's Frank Converse, Jack Warden, mm -hmm. who's one of the funniest men I've ever worked with in my life. Mm -hmm. And he was not a comedian. He was a dramatic actor, but boy, was he funny. Gotcha. Uh, and that's me in the middle, of course. 
But that was uh, that was NYPD, and and uh, we we really burned up New York. Boy. Yes, you did. Oh, because I'm from New York, so I can oh, remember you... when y'all would shoot outdoors. We'd go down there. I'd get out of high school and uh -huh. sneak down and watch you guys do. Yeah, that. yeah, yes. big time. Yes. And that was one of the wonderful thing about things about shooting NYPD was the people that were watching us shoot mm -hmm. were all New Yorkers, and they were so proud yes, that right. we were shooting this series. Mm -hmm. No problems. No now, problem. if you, now, if you go into a city mm -hmm. to, to, to film, you're going to have all kinds of problems. People are going to want you to pay them. Oh, yes. oh you, this is my neighborhood. You, <laughs> you got to walk around money. Producers have walk around money. We call it wham, yes. That's the only <laughs> way that they can finish shooting a That's scene right. on the streets of New York. That's right. Anyway. We got another one? Yeah, there you go. Oh, wow. That's Cicely Tyson and I. That's a movie called uh, Just an Old Sweet Song. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kevin uh, was in that as well. And so was uh, Eric, my, my, my other son. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's Just an Old Sweet Song. Wow, Cicely Tyson. Yes. She looks the same. Yes, she does. <laughs> Look who's talking. You have an AZ. Oh, please. Yes. Uh, next one, please, sir. Oh, yeah. That, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, Leonard Nimoy directed me in that. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, Star Trek, the movie. The Star movie. Trek, not the series. Mm -hmm. That was the Star Trek III, mm -hmm. The Search for Spock. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, now, you talk about groupies. You've never seen anything until you've seen a, tre a Star Trek groupie. <laughs> they go and steal. They go into your dressing room and steal your wardrobe. What? Oh, please. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that was fun, though. It was wow. fun. Star Trek. Three. Next one, please. That's, of course, when they were, I was inducted into the uh, History Makers. Of course, you're a member of yes. the History Makers as well. But it's, it's just a very interesting uh, uh, organization. Yes, and it is. It's, uh, you know, I'm proud to be uh, a member of uh, History Makers because there's nothing like making history. It sure is. And we've done it. They'll be reading about you for years to come. Indeed. It's all Indeed. in the history books. Yeah, you, you know, that's what I tell people. You know, I, it's not about me talking about me. Yes. It's all in the history books. The books. Yeah. Just get the books. Get it right. Mm, read them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Ah, uh, uh, we know who that is. Yes. That's my son, Kevin. Uh, who uh, was, became famous on television in a series called The White Shadow uh, basketball uh, series. And Ron Howard was the white coach, the mm -hmm. white shadow, mm -hmm. who just passed away recently. Yes, he did. Uh, Ron. But Kevin, Kevin is now, has just wrapped a six-part uh, miniseries that he's in Johannesburg shooting, or he's been in Johannesburg shooting, on the life of Nelson Mandela. It's a six-hour miniseries. I believe it's a BET project. Lawrence Fishburne is playing uh, Nelson Mandela, and the movie is called Madiba, which was one of the nicknames, uh, the father of, yes, uh, of the freedom, yes, freedom yes. Uh, Madiba. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be on, it'll be aired sometime, I think, early uh, in 17. Okay. And that's my son, Kevin, very proud of him. I but are. I have um, other sons that are in the industry as well, but Kevin's the number one. Gotcha. Next one, please. Now, that's Sounder. That was one of the biggest movies <coughs> to be done in, in Hollywood, mm -hmm. a black story, mm -hmm. uh, nominated for many Academy Awards uh, with Lonnie Elder, who wrote it. Uh, Cicely was nominated. Paul was nominated. Kevin got cheated out of a nomination in that, I thought. That boy that, uh, that uh, Paul is carrying in his arms, mm -hmm. that's my other son, Eric. Mm -hmm. And so both, that's Kevin in the front, and the little girl, you can't see her behind Kevin. But uh, that's both my sons, Kevin and Eric, uh, in Sounder, the classic movie, uh, Sounder. Next one, please. Hey. Ah, that, of course, is uh, my third and final uh, <laughs> marriage. It's her first, and that's when Lori Marlowe and I were married in Florida. Uh, on June 15th, uh, eight years ago, uh, and um, it's just been a joyous uh, 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 marriage, well, living with her and just uh, sharing. And she's a writer and a, just a brilliant woman, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the two of us just, you know, you know we're just so happy in, in what we're doing. We're designing and developing stuff. She's a writer. She's got a brilliant movie 
on one of the great black singers of all time, of the latest Snow. Okay. Uh, so she she's uh, got that uh, uh, that she's working on. Uh, we're trying to get that produced, and we're trying to get it to Gugu and Basa Raw. Uh, but uh, we 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 we're working on opening the doors for that. But that's my marriage, eight years ago to Laurie Gay Marlowe. Uh, who, who's using her own name? She didn't take my name, of course. On the on my our marriage certificate, it's, it's a, but I could care less. Uh, <laughs> how can you beat Lori Marlowe? That's a great name. great name, and she's just one of those women. She wants. She's a professional woman. She wanted to keep her name, and I said, and she thought I might be offended. Her mother really thought I'd be offended. Uh, Don't you want to take his name? I said, no, 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 no. She doesn't have to take my name. I got her. So I don't need, she doesn't need to take my name. So she, of course, has my name, but she's a professional woman, and she keeps her name Lori Marlowe. God bless you guys. Yeah, God yeah. Bless you guys. So that, that's, uh, that's my story. And you're sticking to it. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more, and of yes. course the book, yes. uh, my book, my memoir, is called More Than Myself. Uh, that's the title, but the subtitle is At the Crossroads of Art, Politics, Culture, and the Civil Rights Movement. Gotcha. And uh, that, that's, my life has been about giving, my life has been about giving uh, my, my expertise, my celebrity, using my right. celebrity mm -hmm. to help others. Gotcha, gotcha. 1970 through 1979, was, uh, a period of time called Black Exploitation came about in the film industry. In 1972, you played the role of Mr. T. Mr. T. In a movie called Trouble Man. Trouble Man. Yes. Hey, sir, could you please run that video? Oh, for us? we yes, got a video. Trouble is here. He's street smart and steel hard. He's a healer, a fixer. My name's T, baby. Wears six hundred dollar suits, drives a ten thousand dollar car, and he carries two guns. One to stop trouble and one to make trouble. He was born in the ghetto and raised in the streets. He's been a man since he was a kid. And trouble is this man's name. If you're a friend of Mr. T's, you can count on him. How's my baby? I'm good. But if you're not, you can count yourself out. Couldn't even a damn who owns it or what color. Now you see that baby, I'll come back and see to you. You dig it? If you've got trouble, call T and leave a message. Service is prompt, efficient, and deadly. We move in on Big's business and the money comes rolling in like waves on the shore. All we gotta do is get rid of Mr. T. T is on the streets right now. One man, Chuck. He's just one man. Don't make him sound like a goddamn army. He has one edge, and that's his cool. But that's enough, baby, because he's thinking all the time. And if he wants your ass, he gets it. Trouble, man, is mayhem. Rub him wrong, and he'll blow up in your face before you shoot my man, Abby. I didn't. You and Jimmy got to go away for a couple of days. Where do you want to go? For what? What for? I got some trouble to have. This is Pete Cockrum. I want to talk to Chalky. This is T. Chalky's dead. Now I'm coming to get your honky ass. Looking for trouble, look out, cause trouble is here. Trouble man, you jive him, he'll wash you away. All right. All my, right. my, my. Brought back some memories, didn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> the guy, that last scene when I was beating up on the guy in the elevator, <laughs> I actually made a mistake and uh -huh. hit him with an elbow. And, and knocked him out. I mean, they had to call the medics, and, you know. But, yeah, T was uh, cold-blooded. He, You don't mess with T. And it's funny because that voiceover, yes. that voiceover, that voice, that incredible voice, belonged to uh, one of the great actors of all time and one of my dearest friends in the world who's gone now. His name is Adolf Caesar. Adolf Caesar. And what a voice. Yes. What a voice. Mm. 
Mm. What a voice. And what an actor. Yes. Who directed me, as a matter of fact, in, in a couple of uh, uh, plays. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the title of uh, the play. Yeah, anyway, it escapes me now, but Adolf is gotcha. one, of the, yeah, one of the great. He's gone now, but boy, what a voice. Yeah, I remember I used to stay at his place when I'd go to New York. Right when I was living out here, and I'd go into New York, mm -hmm. and he is a voiceover guy. He yes. made tons of money, and and, and he would go. He would he says, "Be right back, boy. Be mm -hmm. right back." <clears throat> and I'd have my coffee, whatever. And he'd come back, and he'd throw this envelope on the bed, right, you know, and 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 all these checks would come out. He'd, he'd just go to his agents right. and pick up his checks, and that's how he made his living. Not so much as an actor, but as a voiceover. voiceover. But I tell you, his performance. Uh, and he was nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in a soldier's play mm -hmm. uh, where he played Sergeant Waters yes. uh, with Denzel and Samuel and all of them. Yes. And that was a Negro Ensemble Company play. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but Adolf Caesar, that was his voice. Hmm. Trouble Man. And of course, the soundtrack was by Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye wrote and produced it. And, and I would go to his hotel uh, and when he was writing it. Mm -hmm and playing around the piano, and I'd go to his hotel, I tell you, it was something. I said, Marvin, you know, I don't know how you do it with all these women around here. <laughs> oh, jeez, but it was just so much fun working, seeing him yes, write that from score. Washington. From D.C., yes. I knew him from D.C., and uh, we, were, we were good friends as well. Gotcha. But what a score he wrote, and Trouble Man, of course, is a classic. What is your most memorable role? My most memorable role was in a play uh, by Jean Genet. Okay. It was an off-Broadway play called The Blacks. And the role was, James Earl Jones did the role originally, and then I came in and replaced James Earl Jones. It was called, the, the character was Diodatus Village. Village was the character. What a fantastic role that was. I had so much fun every night doing that play and that role. I mean, I just couldn't wait to get to the theater every night. I've had some wonderful roles in my career, but if I had to single out one role, it would be Village in the Blacks. Gotcha. And uh, in the play, do we have a minute so oh, I can please, talk about please. In the play, Village, I mean, it has this monologue. Mm -hmm. And every night I would pick out a person in the audience. It was We did it in the round at the St. Mark's Playhouse, which is just a, one of the great theaters, small theater, 145 seats, but just a great, great theater. And I would pick out a, a, a woman in the audience, mm -hmm. and I would do the, the monologue. Madam, I bring you nothing comparable to what is called love. What is happening within me is very mysterious and cannot be accounted for by my color. Oh, when I beheld you, when I beheld you, you were walking in the rain in high heels. You were wearing a black silk dress, black stockings. You were carrying a black umbrella. And that's a part of the monologue. So I would use this. Well, Martin Luther King and Coretta came to see the blacks, which is a big, big hit. Mm -hmm. And everybody, whenever you had to go see the blacks, yes. just like uh, you've got to go see Hamilton if, you, if you're now yes. you go to New York. Of course, I couldn't afford it. I was going to talk about that, oh, the cost please. of these movies, please. But anyway, so now mm -hmm. I decided, because there was Martin Luther King, and we were all so proud, right. because it was right at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, and Martin was doing his thing, and he came to see us in the play. I picked out Coretta Scott King to do my monologue to, not knowing that she actually has a background as a singer, mm -hmm. and I believe she had some acting uh, lessons as well. So now I zero in on her, and I said, Madam, you know, I bring you nothing comfortable. So I said, zero in on her. And she was like a member of the cast. She sat there, and she was taking him, and Martin was sitting there going, <laughs> and I'm going right to her, and I'm walking to her, mm -hmm. very, you know, like snake like, you know, doing my monologue as a village in my tuxedo and all. As a matter of fact, there's a picture that we took afterwards where, with Martin and Coretta and uh, Louise, Louise Heath is one of the actresses. Louise Stubbs, not Louise Heath, was one of the actresses. And there's a picture that's on my wall with Martin and Coretta. Mm -hmm. But I, I was so blown away how she accepted what I was bringing to her. And you would have think, thought 
that she was a member of the cast because of the way she sat and she actually got into this character. Yes. Uh, you know. So anyway, Martin was really, you know, so when we, afterwards we went and had dinner and Martin, uh, we talked about that and, you know, he could, that I had, by that time I had built the group theater workshop Yes. and he had heard about that and he encouraged me to continue and I was saying to him how disappointed I was that I couldn't be on the front lines in the South with them and voter registration and just all, yes. but I was able to do a lot in New York to raise money. As an activist. As an activist, yes. to raise money for the cause. Mm -hmm. And so he said, but just what you guys are doing on the stage yes. is just as important as being on the front line. Keep doing what you're doing. So my one of the people that encouraged me to become a producer and to build the theater companies that I've built in my life was Martin Luther King. Yeah, but, oh, that, uh, the point I was trying to make, and you brought it up, the cost of seeing Hamilton is past ridiculous. Un unbelievable. $1,500 for That's crazy. Ticket. That's crazy. It is. <laughs> I mean, you know. It's a great play, but. Geez. Yeah, I mean, but you know what? They are going to sell that house out every night. Yes. So it's not like people are not going to spend the kind of money. Mm -hmm. I think they went up on the prices just recently because of the, the scalpers yes. that are just going crazy, crazy. outside the theaters. Mm -hmm in New York, all, not just that play, but all plays. And so I think they jacked the price up even even higher than $1,500. That's yes. crazy. Did you see this year's Tony Awards? I did see, I didn't see all, we have it. We yes. recorded it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen all of it, uh, but I will, we have it. So, you know, uh, I'll get a chance to see. Made you proud. I, I did see mm -hmm. that, the part, the, the opening with, yes. with the, uh, the big special mm -hmm. of Hamilton. I did see that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the whole of the Tony Awards, I did not see yet, but That's I have it. As an actor, mm -hmm. how do you get a chance to choose your roles? Well, a lot of actors don't have that <coughs> opportunity to choose their roles. You know, I mean, I was one of those actors mm -hmm. that would get offers. Mm -hmm. The only way you can choose a role is if you get an offer, yes. right? And you, <clears throat> they'll send you the script, and you'll see if you want to do this. Gotcha. For the most part, actors or go and they audition for these roles. So they don't get a chance to choose anything. Uh, I was fortunate and a lot of other, you know, black actors that have moved on to another level in their careers mm -hmm. as professionals don't have to worry about, uh, you know, auditioning. Uh, I didn't mind it when I did audition, but at, you, it reaches, you reach a point when yes. you've done certain kinds of work and the producers know you, yes. then they ask you. Yes. You don't have to where, and if you don't want to do it, you read the script and say, nah, I'm not, uh, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't happen that often, but I have turned down roles gotcha. in gotcha. my career. But uh, it's, it's, when you reach that point, it's wonderful. And they're actors, you know, Denzel and Lou Gossett doesn't have to worry about, uh, you know, auditioning. He's got an Academy Award, right. so, you know, right. as does Denzel. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, um, you, you, if you, uh, there were times in my career early on when I auditioned and, uh, but to choose a role is a wonderful feeling mm -hmm. to say your agent says, well, I'm sending a script over, read it. And if you want to do it, yes. then I'll get back to the producers. Yes. Then you've arrived, <laughs> you know. And, like uh, being at Sardis and they bring the phone to you. Baby. Exactly, you know. <laughs> and, I, you know, my career yes. has been wonderful and all that, but my career has not really been, my the interest, my pride is not m my success in my career mm -hmm. at all. My pride as a human being, especially as a black man, is the things that I've been able to do for other people. Yes. The, the, the companies that I've created, the opportunities I've created, uh, for other people, that if my companies were not there, they would not have had the opportunity to become, you know, they, you know, as successful as they had. Now there are actors that came through my theater companies that would have been successful anyway, mm -hmm. but not as successful. Yes. Uh, you know, but you know, look, it's it's not about me, and that's that's where I think uh, I'm proud of the work that I've done in my career is because, yeah, I've loved the roles that I've done yes. and the people that I played opposite. You showed Cicely Tyson and I, and mm -hmm. I, that was just one. As a matter of fact, Cicely Tyson and I, the very first time I worked with her, mm -hmm. was in the blacks on that stage. Okay. She wasn't there. She wasn't doing the role when, I, when, uh, uh, when Martin Luther King and Coretta came. 
But that's when I first started working with Cicely, and Cicely and I have done work. Yes. But I've been fortunate to work with many, many uh, black women stars, yes. uh, many. Right. And uh, some, most of them are still my friends. Like I said, coming in, we are very honored to have you here today. You keep a very low-key posture. You d and I want to thank you. Last year, you were, you were on a panel for the Inner City Cultural Center. And I want to thank you because I'm on that board of directors. Oh, okay. And it was a fun, what you had to say there, for those, there was a lot of good things that came out of you. We thank you very, very much for that, for that appearance that you did that time. Well, it's my pleasure. That was my pleasure then, and it certainly is my pleasure uh, today. Uh, and also meeting this wonderful young engineer, Laurent, uh, who's really impressive. And he reminds me of the young professionals or wannabe professionals that I worked with as actors and writers and dancers and choreographers and all. Laurent reminds me of uh, that, so I had to give him a plug. Amen. He probably doesn't want it, but I gave it to <laughs> him anyway. Him anyway. <laughs> I gave Thank it to you. him anyway. <laughs> It's what I do. Exactly. It's exactly. I work with the youngsters, young mm -hmm. professionals. It's what I do. I can yeah. see it. Mm -hmm. I can see it in a person. I can see the sincerity mm -hmm. that they want to really be the best at what they do. Yes. How do you want to be remembered? Uh, geez. I think I want to be remembered for the, th the opportunities that I have created for others, others in the arts others in politics. Mm -hmm. I'm very much into politics. I'm a politico. Uh, but a lot of people that are in politics, I've helped mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to be remembered for the things I've done for others, not necessarily for the acting and the success as a, you know, a, a, as a celebrity. That that's, I, uh, that's fine, it's wonderful, but that's not how I want to be remembered. And that's not how I don't think I will be remembered. I'll be remembered for the things I've done for others. By the same token, you don't age a bit. Every time I see you, look you know, out vibrant out there. Well, the hair gets wider. <laughs> the hair gets wider, but hopefully, you know, my enthusiasm and people, when I tell them how old I, I am, they don't believe me. But it's and I said, what do you do? What are your secrets? Well, my secret is people communicating with people. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to eat right. You got to do you know you do mm -hmm. your proper exercises in California. Living in California, I'm sorry, is a, a high-level wellness. If you're smart, you'll keep in your head. And that makes you feel younger. It makes you feel youthful. Mm -hmm. uh, and it uh, keeps you from sagging and going to pot, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's really, uh, the secret is, in my mind, the secret has always been, I've always been into people. I love communicating with people, mm -hmm. young, old, black, white, LGBT, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I can't communicate with those crazy people that are voting for and following Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Those people are just idiots, but uh, <laughs> I couldn't communicate with them. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, people, people keep you on your toes, and there's a high-level wellness thing that I feel when I can communicate with people. Sometimes the communication doesn't work yes. and they get angry and you find yourself wanting to argue with them but being strong enough to say, walk away. Yeah. But it's people. Yeah. And that's how, you know, I live to be 110 years old. Yeah. <laughs> we got just a couple of moments left, but you sure. indicated a book. Talk about that book, please. Before well we it's my it's my memoir. It's a yes. story of my life. It's my autobiography and it talks about what we've been talking about today, mm -hmm. and a whole lot more, and it and it's 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 been my life has been a very very interesting life because I started out as an artist as an actor, but I ended up as a, an advocate, as a, pol a politico, a civil rights worker. Uh, I, I've you know acting was just uh, you know it was just there, but I used it yes. in order to move myself and help others. So uh, the book is called More Than Myself. Okay. How do I get a copy? More Than Myself. That's, that's the title, mm -hmm. but there's a subtitle that I must complete. Mm -hmm. uh, at the Crossroads of Art, Politics, Culture, and the Civil Rights Movement. Now, the book's not published okay. yet. Okay. The book is not published because, you know, a couple of the big publishers had it. But, you know, when they heard Robert Hooks, the actor, wrote a book, well, they want me to write about 
the salacious stuff. They want me to write about the women in my life. You know, my life has been what we've been talking about for the last hour. Yes, the arts, mm -hmm. culture, people. That's what my life is about. I will hold off. My book will be published. It's done. But I'm not going to just let anybody publish my book because if an actor writes a book, they are looking for certain things. Yes. They're not going to get it from me. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm dead and gone and the book isn't done, the book will eventually get done right, right. the right way. So thank you, my brother, for having me. We are so glad. I wish we had more time. We have to bring you back again, Robert. Definitely, definitely. Okay. God hey. bless you for who you are and what you've done, man. You've done a lot of great things, and a lot of people look up to you. We love you, brother. Well, thank, thank you very thank much, you. Ron. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, we want to say to our viewers, uh, we have had a great day today with Robert Hooks. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.